Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this lightning talk session on quality and continuous improvement. We have two chat options, one on the right hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions uh, from the speakers, for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to, into resources, and or asking your questions. To help our moderator, if you are asking a question to the speakers, would you please put a question mark at the beginning of the question? This makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Kelly Brandt, and we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Let's see. It'll be good morning, good afternoon. I don't know. It's a variety of people. I'm just glad that you're all participating with us. Again, my name is Kelly Brandt. I work at Boise State University. and I will be your moderator, as Cheryl said. I'll be sharing your questions that we learn across the question list with the presenters um, and obviously monitoring the time as we go along. As we pointed out, there are special times. We'll have a question and answer. And at the end, there'll be some additional time for question and answer. So, I don't want to take up too much of the time here. Our presenters, we have Christine Bauer and Lisa Berry, both from Boise State University, my colleagues here, uh, Brenda Boyd from Qual Quality Matters, and Shannon Riggs, and again, a colleague working at Oregon State University. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine and Lisa so they can share a little bit more about themselves and, of course, provide some valuable insights of what they're doing at Boise State. Christine, Lisa, turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelly. So just to follow up on that, good morning, good afternoon. Hope, good day for everybody, happy Tuesday. Uh, my name is Christine Bauer, and uh, as we can see on the next slide of the presentation, hopefully, <laughs> we have um, some things to share with you about the online program design process that we've been facilitating here at Boise State since about 2013. So um, as you can see there, my uh, title is Associate Dean. I'm one of two Associate Deans here in Extended Studies at Boise State. Also the Executive Director of the Campus Center here at Boise State University. So we have a team of about 45 uh, highly talented individuals who are dedicated to helping faculty and academic departments develop and deliver high quality online programs and courses here at Boise State. Lisa? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Berry, and I am the Associate Director of Instructional Design Services at Boise State. Uh, we focus exclusively on online courses and courses for online programs, which is what we're going to talk about today. Great. And on the next slide, it gives you a little introduction about what the online program design process is. So, in a nutshell, this is a process where we um, get together with a program and department uh, faculty members, chairs, stakeholders of, of those who are trying to develop a new online program. And we, it's a facilitated process with our team members where we strategically design a solid and intentional foundation for the online program, as well as to uh, facilitate the course development process so that it's based on research and best practices in both the discipline and online education. Typically this process occurs after the program has gone through the first phase of, of formal internal approval. So um, there's usually what we call a go no go meeting with the uh, provost office, as well as the college deans to say, yes, this is a program that we wanna move forward with. It's, uh, it's concept and it's viable program. And we think it's important for the university. We're gonna move forward with that. So after that approval process is when this process comes into play. And so over a semester timeline, um, there's several meetings that are scheduled. The meetings range between one and two hours apiece. And there's also some homework or activities that the department engages in as part of those meetings. Um, as we go through this process, you'll, you'll get a better sense of those kinds of activities. Lisa, you wanna talk a little bit more? Uh, yeah, so on the, on the next slide, um, who is involved? So from our uh, eCampus team, usually the 
Associate Director for Instructional Design Services, which uh, is me at now, facilitates that process and then also bring in one of our instructional design consultants to um, observe and participate to uh, from the from our internal perspective to have that information and carry it down um, through the streams within our department. But from the academic department, we usually involve, like to involve an online program coordinator from the academic department, also the chair and or the dean, and then a variety of faculty from the department. We've had anywhere from uh, from an academic department, one or two people involved, and as many as six or seven people involved in this process. Um, it's, it's important to think about how many people are involved because oftentimes the more people that are involved, the slower decisions are to be made, just because there's a lot of really good discussion that happens, but it ends up um, taking longer with some decisions made. So there's there's a challenge to find that kind of happy medium of people involved in the process um, that are consistently involved with the process. We do also bring in, depending when uh, the time is appropriate and the content is appropriate to bring in sometimes external stakeholders from the field uh, who have a, a stake in the program, potential students or past students from similar programs, um, employers of those future graduates, and then people from across the university that are experts in um, other aspects of the program and services that the university provides. So places like the library, our um, Office of Information Technology, um, our um, Educational Access Center to deal with accessibility and accommodations for students, um, our academic integrity team, things like that to help the academic department think through how those aspects are unique to their online program and how to strategically plan for those. Christine. Mm -hmm. We Thanks, just Lisa. hold for one quick second. It appears that feed loop disconnected from Zoom. Um, so it says it's trying to reconnect. So if we could just give it a second. Um, I also will reach out to my colleagues um, to see if there are other issues. Be one second. This is where the elevator music comes into play. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I am not going to hum. Oh, come on, Kelly. Oh. Okay, we hopefully are back in just a second. Okay, we appear to be back. Thank you for holding. No worries. Thanks, Cheryl. If we can move to the next slide. Great. So as Lisa explained, there's several stakeholders that are involved in this process. So it is a time commitment that um, is made up front to participate in this. So it's really important to be clear on why even do this in the first place. And so we listed several of the reasons that we've um, shared with our uh, partners as we go through this process together. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we want to be able to design the curriculum of the program to meet the specific needs of online students. And so knowing that the program is being designed to target a specific student audience, being grounded in who that student audience is, what their needs are, and what the goals of the program are to help meet their educational goals, as well as being really cognizant of designing for the online environment. And so we wanna be able to maximize those pieces of the online learning environment to really make this a high quality program. So 
being intentional about those components is really important and to be talking that through at a programmatic level. In a nutshell, the, re the most important reason is we want to ensure that's going to be a cohesive learning experience for the students. So as opposed to like a collection of courses that students take online, we want to make sure that the program has that foundation where there's a solid curriculum in place. We do curriculum mapping to ensure that there are no gaps in the curriculum or that there's overlaps of the curriculum where things are taught multiple times. Um, we also want to make sure that any of the uh, applicable standards in the discipline, or if they have accreditation standards that are specific to their field, that we're going to integrate that into uh, the actual design of the program, as well as to be explicit about what the students will be able to achieve by the end of the program. So defining what those program learning outcomes will be, and then mapping out how students progress through the program by taking the courses and increasing their skills in order Order to achieve those outcomes at the end. We also talk about developing an action plan for program assessment. So here at Boise State, all uh, degree programs go through a program assessment review process, it's called PAR. And so um, when we're talking about that program design, we also want to talk about how that program might be, uh, what are some of the strategies in which to assess the program as students are completing it. So how do we know for sure that the students are achieving those program learning outcomes at the different stages of their journey through that um, learning experience? In addition, we wanna be intentional about creating strong ties between courses within the program. So for example, if there's an initial uh, learning experience at the beginning of the program, and then there's pieces throughout the curriculum where they are, um, you know, perhaps building a project or a research uh, component or something and have a culminating experience at the end, we want to be intentional about explaining how that works for the student, as well as when faculty are coming through to develop the courses, that those pieces get intentionally designed into the course. Um, and then also providing a framework for consistency across courses. One of the things that we know about online students, we know that having a, a consistent navigation, look and feel, expectations, those kinds of things are really helpful for students because once they have that from the first course, they can expect that throughout the rest of the courses so that they can focus on learning rather than trying to navigate to find, okay, where is the syllabus located in this course, for example. So having some of those consistencies across the courses defined upfront at a programmatic level and then shared with faculty as those courses are being developed is really crucial to help ensure that that um, consistency is there for the students. So uh, communicating those programmatic elements and expectations um, clearly to both students and faculty. So these come into play uh, as far as, you know, if, if for example, the program wants students to use APA format, um, that's clearly delineated up front and used consistently throughout the uh, program. So that's one just real simple example. And then for faculty, as far as, you know, turnaround time on grading or response time to student emails, that that's uh, uh, an element that the program can choose to define upfront. So that as faculty come through and teach those courses, um, they know what's expected of them as well on behalf of the program. And then of course, to establish a plan for continuous improvement and course maintenance. So um, all this planning effort upfront, we wanna make sure that there's also a continuous improvement plan so that as courses are being taught, they're updated and the curriculum is updated the program outcomes are assessed, there may be some changes needed to the curriculum so that there's always an improvement process for the program. So one of the things that we have um, shared with our partners as, as we go through this pro process together is by going through this uh, facilitated process together, it helps the program to meet 48 of the 59 standards. And this is a reference to the Online Learning Consortium um, 
quality scorecard for the administration of online programs. And there's a link there for you to use. Um, this is based on the older version. It's been recently updated, um, but that's been one of the things that we've shared with our partners as we go through this process. It'll help them meet a number of these standards as well. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about how that's structured? Yes. So um, this slide kind of takes all that information that Christine was talking about and places it into four general categories or the four pillars of the program design. So um, the first is the context. And with almost anything in higher education, I think context is an important part of, of just knowing what is going on. So with the context piece, we really work to articulate the context surrounding the program. There's more information on that that will be coming in the next slide. But uh, things like knowing who the students are and where they're headed once they complete the program um, and just kind of an understanding of how that program fits into those students' lives and is able to help them is kind of what the context is about. The next section is alignment, and that's very uh, specific to the curriculum itself. So thinking about what the courses are, the program learning outcomes, how those courses fit into the outcomes, and then how the assessments within each of those individual courses feed into the curriculum map and then the program learning outcomes. Uh, the third big category is specifications. And this is where we fall back on research in best practices and use that to document some of those program level consistencies across courses. Christine in the last slide was talking about faculty expectations, student expectations. Those are also documented here just to help those uh, students have a cohesive learning experience throughout the program. So during this specifications, uh, phase of program design, it is really documenting those so that everybody's on the same page when it comes to what those consistencies are for students. So we have one place to go back to, uh, to make sure that everybody in the academic department, as well as in the eCampus, when we're helping them design their courses, kind of adheres to those specifications once they're defined. And then the last category or the last pillar there is thinking ahead to the development and also the launch of the program. So thinking about standards, policies, processes, uh, creating a course development plan, everything to set them up for, for success once we're finished with this program design process and moving forward into either course design and development or the launch and maintenance of the courses. Uh, Christine, I think you're going to talk more about the context now. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. So diving in a bit deeper on that first pillar in relation to context. So there's three components to this uh, pillar. So the first one being the program structure. And again, um, so, so this process happens after the program has gone through the first phase of, of uh, internal approvals. And so the pro one, one of the pieces that comes from the conceptualization, visualization, the, the budget piece before it's approved that first time, one of the key pieces of that process that our new programs development team um, helps co-create with our partners who are developing the new program is a program structure document. And that document outlines um, some of the high level pieces about the overall vision and the overall structure of the program, including details like the launch semester, uh, what, what the vision and goals and mission of the program entails, what kind of enrollments are anticipated. Um, so some of those bigger picture elements of the program structure. So we go through that uh, document together and, and we just ask some more specific questions to glean some more insights from um, the faculty members in the department. And then the student persona is another piece that is also revisited. Um, during that initial process with conceptualization uh, and also the feasibility of the program, we talk a lot about the, the student and defining who that student is. So is this program 
for students that are just starting their careers? Is this a program for students who want to advance their careers or that want to finish their degree and, and had some uh, previous college experience or someone who just wants to change careers entirely? And sometimes programs might uh, have two or three of these uh, audiences that they want to um, meet their needs, educational needs with. So we talk more about the student personas and that becomes really important when um, we have uh, 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 online students, we wanna make sure we're targeting the correct, uh, the student that we're trying to um, address here. Another piece is the program map. This is often confused with the curriculum map. There's two different things. The program map is a visual representation of the program um, that really uh, illustrates the student pathway throughout the program. And if we go to the next slide, knowing that we've got some time limitations here, um, I'm gonna show, show you an example of one of our programs, uh, program maps. And this is based on um, Steele and Lewis's work here, uh, the, the mapping primer, you can see the citation at the bottom there. But you can see this visual where it shows the overall purpose and goals of the program, as well as how students come into the program with some prerequisite and entry requirements, what they will be graduating with, um, oftentimes the program learning outcomes, and what their experience will be in the middle as they are completing these courses being very explicit about any ties between courses, how, how they um, connect with one another, as well as the progress through the, the program. Lisa, you wanna talk a little bit next about the alignment? Yes, so um, we hinted a little bit about these components in the alignment piece already. So we start with the program learning outcomes and think about that as really the kind of 10,000 foot view. We wanna make sure that those are clearly articulated measurable outcomes and kind of defines what the students need to be able to do once they complete the program. From there, we use a spreadsheet to create a curriculum map and really like most curriculum maps, I guess, uh, if you're familiar with them is really, it's just a grid aligning each of those individual courses with the program learning outcomes so that we can kind of see a visualization of how the different courses work together to help meet those program learning outcomes. Um, from there, we move into the next level of detail. So if the program learning outcomes is the 10,000 foot view, the curriculum map might be 5,000, the course development guides get us down to about the 1,000 foot view. And that is where we get the program to really, the program leadership to think about what are each of those individual course learning outcomes and what are the key assessments in those courses that are going to feed back to the program learning outcomes. Um, this is also a place where if the program uh, leadership has some really clear defined ideas of what needs to be in a course, once it gets developed, this is the place that they document that information. Because once we move later into the course development, this course development guide is kind of the starting point for that course development and defines the must haves that are there for a course for it to be uh, considered part of that program and to be successful part of that program, I guess I should say. So that's what the course development guides are. And then we also, uh, provide the academic department the opportunity to really be proactive in thinking about their program assessment, which is something that our university requires every three years. And so um, they can take their time up front here to think about how, how that program assessment will work and kind of plan for that as they're designing their curriculum map and program learning outcomes. And so that's it for alignment. Great, thanks Lisa. So the next pillar deals with specifications and um, there's three components to this pillar. First is a literature review where we take a look at the best practices in both the discipline as well as online education and really look for that sweet spot. So if, if, we, if we think of those two fields as a Venn diagram, that intersection between those two is kind of where we're, we're trying to, to narrow down in. So if, there are, if there's literature, if there's research studies that say, these are the instructional strategies that, that have 
been effective in other programs um, for this kind of discipline, we really want to bring that forward and see if that's something that the program wants to consider being a consistent um, use of that pedag pedagogical or instructional strategies, which then translates over to the program specifications. So that's where those things are documented. If, if they know, for example, case study format in business is something that's um, you know, an instructional strategy that, that's been very effective for the field. And that's something that the online program wants to utilize that we're specifying that. So with that, um, we also have the course level commonalities, faculty expectations, like I mentioned earlier, as well as the quality assurance plan. So all of that is kind of clearly documented in one place and articulated by the program. And then from that work are templates that are created. So again, um, we have uh, uh, syllabus templates that we start with that the program then customizes to their needs, as well as the course template. So again, um, you know, having things placed in the, in the same location can really help students to um, know where those things are located. So Lisa, you want to talk a little bit about the last pillar for us? Yes. Um, so the last pillar is um, admittedly kind of a little bit of a catch-all area, and that is continuing to come back to the idea of thinking ahead to the individual course development and then the launch of the program. So one of the things that's important part of this is setting expectations for what comes next. So we provide process overviews um, of what's coming next. So we talk with them about our program services that our unit provides to the academic departments. We talk about and provide an overview of the course design and development process, but also set them up thinking about down the road once their program launches and what course revisions and ongoing continuous improvement, maintenance, and so on of the online courses looks like for their program. And we really work in partnership with each program to find a solution that works for them as well as for us and our other partners across uh, campus. Um, one of the things we also do, which is essential, is to design a course development plan, which outlines the schedule of the, for the design and development of each of those individual courses and making sure that those will get done prior to when that course is supposed to be offered for the program. Uh, we also talk through program orientation. So thinking about what happens to that student between the time that they're admitted to the program until they launch in the first course. And we work pretty closely with our uh, partners in the enrollment and student success department here at, um, in our university to make sure that we're getting those students what they need from uh, when they get ready for their first course. And then I um, hinted at this earlier when I talked about who was involved in the process, but we also bring in different units across campus to talk about um, certain aspects of what their services are and how those apply to the online program uh, to prepare for the course development as well. So, um, the first two listed there, the library can provide a lot of resources to online students. And so making sure that the academic department is in, aware of what all the library can offer. Uh, but similarly, the Education Access Center and what services they can provide that are unique for an online student versus a um, traditional campus-based student. And in watching the time, Christine, I'm gonna hand the slide off to you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So we've learned some things along the way. As I mentioned, we have been uh, facilitating this process since 2013. Um, and initially this was called the 10 step process, which, you know, we've had to make some changes with that because we found out, you know what, it's just not a sequential process. And so having it as steps that, that sounded like they're independent steps and, and that wasn't the reality either. There's a lot of steps that are interconnected. And so uh, we asked for a lot of feedback along the way 
as we've facilitated this with multiple programs and, and they've given us a lot of great feedback in which we've structured into these four pillars. Um, and, then, and then clarifying the connections between each of these uh, components within the pillars. That's been an important piece as well, because as we know, you know, when it comes to curriculum mapping, having the program learning outcomes and, and the assessment plan, all, all of those connections together is really important to be explicit with. Um, and then also ensuring that we are shifting to a, a customized approach. So there's some programs that come to this process that already have some of these components uh, drafted or, or completed. So, you know, for example, if the program learning outcomes, uh, they've, they spent a lot of time and have had input from their faculty and they're pretty solid on there on, on those PLOs, then why spend our time there? Instead, let's focus on the time where they want to spend the most um, of their thinking and, and uh, processing time in. Lisa, can you share some other lessons that we've learned along the way? Yep, and I'm also very aware of the time. So I'm gonna kind of go quickly here. So um, one of the things we learned over time is that uh, a lengthy process is not uh, necessarily productive. So um, kind of reached a point of diminishing returns in, in many cases. So we've tried to shorten up that timeline and customize that as part of customizing that process. Um, and then setting those expectations of what's coming next is critical. So an overview of the course design development process and what maintenance looks like, uh, things like that. And then to be completely transparent, some of the things that are ongoing challenges for us is the ownership of those documents. I saw somebody mentioned a question in the chat about who documents those things and that um, we assist with that, but we also would love for the academic department to take over ownership of those and maintain those documents, but that's been a, a bit of an ongoing challenge for us. Um, sometimes uh, departments aren't ready to think about some of these components, and so they, they pass on those at the time, and that's okay, um, but just kind of realizing the value in that for each of them. And then a good solid transition from this program level planning to individual course development and design is another challenge for our team. All right, right. Kelly. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Lisa. I saw a shout out for the program map there in the feed loop chat. Keep on sh sharing that information. Thank you very much for answering that question there, Christine, for others to see. Now, I do wanna turn it right on over there to Brenda and Shannon again. They will share a little bit about themselves and provide some valuable insights about online program quality. So Brenda, Shannon, the mic is yours. Brenda, please introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Brenda Boyd. I'm Senior Academic Director of Program Services for Quality Matters. And I'm uh, happy to present today with my colleague, Shannon Riggs. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Riggs. I serve as the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Learning Innovation for Oregon State University eCampus. And thank you so much to our colleagues at Boise State for their great presentation. For the next part of this talk, I'd like to shift the focus from new program development to the management and continual improvement of existing online programs. Um, and as um, our colleagues have mentioned, it, this is an iterative process and um, you know, it's a work in progress and it's in, in, uh, something that's continually evolving. And so we're hoping to open this up for discussion toward the end of our talk today to hear um, your thoughts and, um, and what, what kinds of things you're, you're all doing for, um, for program management. If we could go to the next slide. At Oregon State, we offered our first fully online program in 2002. Since then, our portfolio has grown to over 80 fully online degree programs, undergraduate and graduate. And last year, we served over 26,000 students who took at least one online class um, through, through eCampus. As our portfolio grew, uh, we, we knew that we needed to ensure continual improvement of our program quality and enrollment growth. So our goals for program management are to build on strong program development systems, um, and as a centralized support division to, to keep strong relationships with our academic partners. Um, we want to facilitate data-driven program management, and we wanna bring our academic partners together to kind of cross-pollinate those uh, good ideas and things that they've figured out um, for the management of their programs from the academic um, unit side. 
you know, of course, we want to ensure continual improvement um, and to innovate and solve problems as they as they arise. Those are some just general um, goals for, for program management at Oregon State. If we could go to the next slide. And talk a little bit more about what do we mean exactly about quality in online programs and how do we define that? Um, uh, you know, for us, faculty development is a really critical piece of online program quality. And that's, it would include development in course design and basic online teaching, but also development that grows with the faculty member, uh, you know, in um, topics like inclusive teaching, uh, fostering academic integrity, and topics that change over time um, and keep faculty engaged as they um, gain experience uh, through, their, through their online teaching. In the next slide. Another aspect of um, online program quality is, um, of course, uh, course and program development, but also redevelopment. You know, as programs grow, redevelopment takes up more and more of the development time and resources. Um, so it's been important for us to balance the focus with new program development and continually improving existing programs. Because as we, uh, you know, those of us who are working in this field know, um, online program development isn't a one and done kind of enterprise. It's the care and maintenance are needed over time. And the next slide. Another thing, um, another way that we define quality at Oregon State is um, through healthy enrollment numbers to ensure that offering the program is sustainable and that we can maintain that over time. And it of course means student success in meeting their learning outcomes and their satisfaction with the learning experience. Um, it means providing student services like tutoring, proctoring, success coaching, and all the different things that, that students need um, through, their, through their life cycle. For our next slide. You know, another aspect of quality online programming that personally I, I would love to hear talked about a little bit more um, is faculty satisfaction. We talk a lot about student satisfaction, which of course is super important. But I really believe strongly that faculty satisfaction is a component of online program quality. Offering new faculty development opportunities is one aspect um, of, of ensuring a faculty satisfaction, but there are also other opportunities for engagement that we, we really try to proactively create. Our eCampus research unit, I believe our director is even here, or that unit is even here in the audience today. Um, with our faculty fellows program um, helps to keep faculty engaged. We have started a new, in partnership with the College of Engineering, has started a new center for research in uh, engineering education online, another way to keep, to keep faculty engaged. We provide um, some funding for external professional development and attendance of conferences like this one. Um, so ongoing support for innovation. We provide support for open educational resources and the adoption of those and creation of those. Uh, we are in, consistently <laughs> inviting people, uh, inviting faculty to participate in pilots, um, keeping faculty engaged and supported. We, we believe really um, keeps faculty satisfied with their work, excited, and that, that energy that comes from that filters right, right out to our, our students. Next slide. Maybe a little less exciting, but just as important <laughs> is compliance. And so to ensure quality, we have to pay attention to compliance tasks. And whether that's NC SARA, um, institutional and program accreditation and providing that support, professional licensure disclosures, all of those um, things that, that many of you are probably involved in, you know, understanding the compliance requirements uh, for distance education, and then helping academic units who may or may not be as well versed in those in those details, how how they can translate those um, requirements into their day to day teaching and operations is part of the work that we do um, in, in ensuring um, online program quality. Next slide, please. Innovation, of course, um, is is an important aspect of of online program quality. So for us, this means you know, reserving resources for, for new initiatives, pilots, and assessment. It means maintaining relationships with our academic partners to keep a finger on the pulse to, you know, so that we as a support unit understand the challenges our partners are facing. And it means being a partner in problem solving and working as a team. 
Now, a big part of our quality assurance program at Oregon State is also being a quality matters institution. So at that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Brenda. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so quality matters really approaches the idea of, you know, what is quality in an online learner's experience? And so the factors that you see on, this is what we like to call the um, online quality pie. Now, of course, it's a very simplified view of what that, ex what that is, um, what that experience is like for an online learner. Um, but we know that all of that course design work, the forethought, the planning, everything that Christine and Lisa were talking about going into developing a course and a pro, I mean, even a pro, a full program. Um, but there's that course design within, you know, is what it drills into too. So there's your course design, your course delivery, which is the actual teaching of the course. Another component is the course content. Um, and that includes the choices and curriculum, um, what kinds of open educational resources you'll use and so forth. Um, the institutional infrastructure, when students come to your program, do they know that they're signing up for an online program or is it a online synchronous program? I know there's been a lot of conversation on WCET Mix about that lately. Um, the learning management system, is that ready for learners? Is it, does it have the tools that are going, that's going to support the active learning that needs to take place in the courses and programs? Um, and then faculty readiness, are the faculty ready to, to make this shift to online teaching? We know last year, we no one. it didn't matter if you were ready or not, but um, we had to move online quickly. So we, um, so we have been spending a lot of time getting faculty prepared to teach online um, right over the last year and a half. And then student readiness, helping our learners through supports to ensure that they are ready to learn online for orientations to those programs, orientations to um, the courses. Um, so all of those things together really impact the learner experience. Um, so you can move to the next slide, please, Cheryl. So, um, so QM has, um, you may know us from um, course reviews um, and looking at our course review standards in the, in the Quality Matters rubric. But when we have looked at across programs, we've seen that the need for looking at, um, looking at the quality of the program in a more holistic fashion. And so um, some of our members who had you know, had all of the courses in a program certified, can we have our, you know, can we have our program certified? So, um, <clears throat> so the first, um, the first program certification you see on this list is the online program design review. And that is looking at course designs across, um, across a program. Um, so are all of those courses reviewed in some way? Is there a continuous improvement quality assurance process set up for all of the pro all of the courses within a program um, for the design aspect of it. Um, the second online um, program uh, review that we do is the online teaching support. So what supports are there in place to support faculty readiness, to support faculty in an ongoing way to prepare them to teach online? And then the next is the online learner support. How are you supporting your online learners? Are there academic support available to your students? Do they have access to um, all of the same types of services that your on-campus um, students receive as well? So to have that equity in terms of online learners um, and their support. And then finally, the last um, program certification is for online learner success. Are your students being successful in your, course, in your programs? How are you supporting their academic um, attainment through your program? So, <clears throat> excuse me, each of those, um, so, so how do you do a QM program um, review? These are um, for those programs that are mature, um, um, as Shannon said, and as you know, Christine and Lisa were talking about, they've been doing this for quite some time as well. So these require three years of data and they involve more than just your um, office. There, we're asking for that outreach across the institution that Christine and, and Lisa were really talking about and Shannon alluded to as well, where your program is not just the 
the, in that particular academic unit or the online learning, but there's also your institutional research. How are you doing? How are those students doing that are in those, um, in those programs? And so there is a, um, so these online, so these reviews are conducted by Quality Matters certified master reviewers um, who've taken additional professional development on the, our program criteria. And Cheryl um, did share in the chat a link to um, the Quality Matters website that includes all the criteria for the program reviews. Those are out there and freely available. But you do have to have a mature program to do a program review. You you will have to have, you will have had three years of data. Um, and and really have um, representation from across your campus to do to engage in these program reviews. Um, and we also have a um, shared a link that you can see um, other institutions that have engaged and attained these certifications. So if you earn all four of those certifications so within a three year period, then it's um, the exemplary program designation is um, is awarded to the institution for that. So um, you can move to the next slide. There, um, Cheryl. So, um, when you're thinking about your programs, what kinds of goals do you have? Because every institution is different. You may have some strategic goals that you're trying to reach by having by doing quality assurance. So, um, a lot of institutions we have conversations like, where do we begin? Well, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to move the needle on online learning? Are you trying to prepare for um, a successful reaffirmation of accreditation? Um, do you, are you trying to move the culture at your institution toward thinking about these things? So thinking about the quality of your programs um, and, or are you trying to like, just really change the institution or program we all changed in the last couple of years for, ready or not. So um, do, what's your impact to your stakeholders? Do you really, um, are you, is that really your major goal is that you want to improve your outcomes in your online programs? Um, or, and do you want to demonstrate student success? Yes, our students that take our program are successful. They do go on to um, reach gainful employment and so forth. Um, so there's, I think there's one more slide, Cheryl, um, that we can move to. And this is about metrics and data. And Shanna, did you want to speak to this? This is some sure. of the data I think you guys are collecting at Oregon State. Yeah, these are some of the just some of the metrics and data that we're focused on right now. Um, we're looking closely at class size um, and sharing that out college by college. Of course, student success is something we're always looking at. First year retention, retention beyond the first year. Um, we're tracking things to some uh, new state laws in Oregon, the, the numbers of class sections with low and no cost materials, just to keep costs down for students um, uh, regarding those course materials. We are looking, of course, at course development cycles, how often courses are being redeveloped, and faculty development uh, completions. And, um, you know, depending on the initiatives or the, the priorities at the moment, this, the metrics and data will shift a little bit. Um, but it's interesting to go from a, um, a focus on program development. There's a, a lot about process and faculty development and training and support. But as we move to um, program management and ongoing uh, continual improvement, there's um, it's not quite as linear um, and and the, the metrics and the data become really important and, and how you're how you're moving the needle, um, whichever needle you're trying to move. Um, so I'd like to move ahead um, now. I know we're coming up on um, some Q&A time, but for some questions for discussion. So we, we had hoped to hear a little bit from our audience about which components you focus on for your online program quality, how you're measuring your online program quality, how you're managing your, your quality assurance, um, and um, how your organizational structure impacts approaches to, to quality assurance. So there we were thinking about, you know, it's just important to Consider how if you are central, centralized or decentralized or, or other, other factors that, that can change. So I'm going to turn to our moderator now and see if we um, have a little bit of time for discussion or if we need to move straight to Q&A. No, I, I would also be curious to hear if anybody in the audience would like to share either in the chat or to unmute and share with the group some of your thoughts regarding the questions that Shannon has on the slide here. Thanks, Kelly.
feel free also to use this time just to ask a question either for our colleagues at Boise State or for Brenda or I. Yes, again, use the chat. If you want to raise your hand, we'll be looking for that. Cheryl's looking for those as well. Uh, as you're thinking of, maybe you're thinking of a question, I'll ask the presenters here. When it comes to participants' willingness to engage with you on these standards of quality and development of programs, uh, how do you help encourage those individuals to be fully bought into these concepts and really engaged throughout the process? I think it really helps to have a common language um, and just to kind of help set some definitions like, and which is why I spent a little bit of time today talking about what do we mean by, by quality and how, how we're defining that. Um, it's the kind of, you know, quality is the kind of word and Brenda knows this maybe better than anyone here and has had conversations around this, this word and um, for, for many years. Um, but, but defining what we mean by quality specifically and using the data and um, just kind of show comparisons and how, um, um, you know, how things are changing over time is, is really an important factor. So I think one of the um, pieces is just uh, staying centered on the student and the success of the student and that we're all here to ensure that students, uh, their learning experience is a high quality one. And sometimes um, it's just recentering on that discussion and that we're all here to help the program, support the program in, in creating a, a really stellar program that they would be proud of and that they find rigorous and, and all of those components of quality that they wanna see as well and that we're here to support them in whatever way. And so um, I think really customizing the process as well as um, the path forward to what it is that they want to achieve as well is really important to have that upfront conversation about why are we doing this? What is it for? Why are we going to spend our time doing this is, is really important. Lisa, do you have anything else to add with your experience? Um, I was, I was just noticing the one comment in the chat about um, the idea of individual buy into the whole process as opposed to individual uh, academic freedoms. And I think that is, especially when thinking about a problem holistically, and there's sometimes some defined, uh, I guess I would say with the air quotes, rules to follow uh, to kind of fit in with that vision for the program that that can be a challenge for individual faculty, but uh, the, the message that I always try to send aligns really closely with what both Shannon and Christine said, which is we're doing this for the students and these are some researched backed um, definitions of what quality is. We refer to quality matters also all the time as we're working through course development because we kind of set that as a benchmark when we design those courses. So, um, yeah. Brindo, would you add anything to that conversation? You know, um, I think that there's a, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of, um, you know, intrinsic motivation, I think that is what happens to where um, institutions and in the people within them are motivated to show the great work that is happening in their campuses and, the, and online, right? Like to show that, we have something we're really proud of here and we want someone to take a look at it and show us that this is, this really is, you know, to valid, to validate it, right. To say this, they really have done a fantastic job here and having, you know, some, um, a quality assure of your choice. Um, <laughs> we just happen to be one, but we are, um, you know, just having a commitment to quality is great and showing that to the world, demonstrating it in, in different ways, you know, can be very powerful and, and helping students understand because we have done a good job, I think, as a higher education community to 
look for that accreditation, look for an institution that's accredited, right? But how do we then show like, these are programs that we have really um, put our hearts and souls into that, um, that have really um, moved the needle. And, you know, and I just have to say, I, I want to give some kudos to the just the community writ large, because, you know, this is all voluntary. You know, there, these aren't requirements from accrediting bodies. These are things that schools do to really show that, you know, to be transparent in their processes and to show their faculty, these are, this is why we're doing it. Remember, you know, it really is all about the learner. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Appreciate job. that. Mm -hmm. I have a comment here. Um, or question, sorry, faculty input, how much faculty input is received or expected throughout the entire process? So again, Lisa, Shannon, maybe the two of you want to chime in on that one. Lots and lots. Um, you know, that's a really, really important factor. Um, you know, the, we're, we partner with faculty at Oregon State, so it's it's um, it's not driven by, by one or the other necessarily. The faculty own the curriculum and are responsible for the instruction, um, but we are responsible for supporting the faculty and helping them design and deliver the course in a way that's going to work for, um, for the students ultimately. Um, Lisa, do you have anything else to, to add? I would echo what you're saying. So we are a support unit at our university. So it is not our course, it is the academic department and the individual faculty's course and program. So we are here to help them. So the faculty input is the crux of everything that we do. And also there was an earlier question from Colleen about um, having a system for measuring quality for existing online courses. Um, you, know, you can't go wrong with the, the quality matters higher education rubric for the design standards. There are certainly others um, others out there that you could look at, um, but I would I would say looking at the design of the course, but also the facilitation of the course, and having some um, some standards in mind or just a common language for for you know paint a picture of what what does good online course design and what does good online teaching look like, um, and then and working from there. I have just one more minute left for us and we got to wrap it up here. Um, well, one or two. Uh, I know there's a couple other questions. Our spiel is always, if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, but through feed loop, you can certainly reach out to the presenters, ask that question of them and get some comments back and forth. So my last question I did notice, does your process change if we're focusing on programs that need to lead to licensure, like nursing or teaching? And if so, what does that change with comes to the process or outcomes? I'm gonna... well, there are certainly some differences in how um, just compliance activities that need to take place um, and some communications around there that, that, that happen around professional license or professional license or disclosure. Um, sometimes for at Oregon State, this will also mean that there um, might be some additional checks within the academic unit to ensure that they're um, abiding by their, you know, that the the, do the final courses really add up to what the, the program learning outcomes are and are they abiding by them if there's for instance program accreditation um, standards to to keep in mind okay great we're right at that time where i will need to say thank you to christine oh look at that nice slide to brenda and christine shannon kelly oh that's me and lisa um, we do appreciate your time. Again, sorry I didn't get to all your questions. I think we'll get that information here so we can respond back to any of those outstanding questions. I appreciate your participation. Cheryl, anything else we need to say to the audience? Well, I, I just want to thank you, Kelly. Thank you for being our moderator. And, you know, I appreciate that you thanked our speakers, uh, Brenda, Shannon, uh, Christine, and Lisa. It was an outstanding session. Uh, and thank you for attending this session. And a huge thank you, as I said, to all the Lightning Talk presenters. I love this idea called the Lightning Talk. A session feedback survey uh, should be popping up uh, soon that we'd really appreciate if you would take the time to fill that out. And, um, you know, the speakers, they, they do enjoy receiving your feedback. So we recorded the session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us next for a fun and casual 30-minute networking lunch beginning at 1130 Mountain. It's 1.30 my time. I'm in Ohio. Uh, so I said, um, 
you know, we hope that you will participate. Um, live participants will be entered into a drawing for a $75 Amazon gift card. So thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful day.